our Bibles and turn over to that passage I read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. As you know, we're studying the ten different times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. And last week, we began our study of Rephidim, which is rebellion test number four, but we summarize very quickly Re Re Revelation, excuse me, <laughs> I'm thinking tonight already, uh, rebellion test number three, which was gluttony, the failure to control the carnal appetites, the seven deadly sins. So that was the third instance of rebellion in the wilderness of sin, Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3. That's the test that exposed Israel's carnal, selfish, self-serving, and many times we may be generous, but we sometimes do it to be self-serving. And we use the generosity as a cover for our self-serving focus on our own personal interests, our own personal comfort and satisfaction. We had also revealed, as we looked at that test, how we all yield to the seven deadly sins and saw that there were four steps, process, principles, procedures, and penalties. In the preceding lessons, we see we have sins that are repeated that lead to greater failures. So when you refer, refuse to learn the first basic lesson, you're guaranteed to fail subsequent tests on the same lesson. Israel failed test one, number one, which rebellion against God ordained leadership, and they failed it again in test number three because they rebelled against leadership. We looked at the connected instances of manna and quail. We saw how God killed many of the adults on the spot. That third instance of rebellion was a focus on gluttony, and we, at that point, reminded you once again of the seven deadly sins and the ways to remember them. Say the three different ways for me. What's one for the seven deadly sins? What's the budak? Gap legs. Gap legs, number one. Slap eggs. Slap eggs. Slap eggs, singular. Number two. What's the third way to remember it? Glass peg, glass peg. Now, for those of you who haven't been with us when we went over the seven deadly sins, those little, you know, phrases enable you to remember, if you spell them correctly, all the seven deadly sins. Gap legs, gluttony, anger, pride, lust, envy, greed, and sloth. Or slap egg, you can just, you know, you remember the word slap egg. Somebody takes an egg and slaps you in the face with a slap egg. You can remember all seven deadly sins. Or... A glass peg with only one S, G-L-A-S-P-E-G. That'll give you all seven deadly sins. The first letter of each one of the seven deadly sins is one of those letters. Easy way to remember. Gluttony, anger, pride, lust, envy, greed, and sloth. And we will find, as we are going through these times that Israel rebelled, that all seven of the deadly sins show up. And as a result, all but two of the adult Jews who left Israel, or left Egypt, died in the wilderness. That's why they're called deadly sins, folks. They will kill you. They will kill you. And God sends his own judgment. So we looked at test three, had two parts. Part one was manna and quails. Part two was manna and hoarding. We talked about the common sin of covetousness uh, among Christians. And we saw that uh, three key principles about covetousness Number one, covetous means you don't really believe that God can meet all of your needs. You think that you got to do it. Number two, hoarding. The outward manifestation of covetousness means that you have a false god. You are worshiping stuff rather than the true God of heaven. And hoarding is the outward manifestation of covetousness. Number three, covetousness is an inward sin that reveals you're expecting a different God to meet your needs rather than the God of heaven. And we saw that the New Testament flatly states that covetousness is idolatry and that covetous people are idolaters. That's Colossians 3, 4 through 7, and Ephesians 5, 3 through 7. But in both cases, you find covetousness is idolatry in verse 5. Colossians 3, 5, Ephesians 5, 5. But that gives you the context, the kind of people that it ties covetous people with. This you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's a rather blunt verse. And I think that most of us, probably when we get to heaven, are going to discover we don't have an inheritance. It's not a question of your salvation. It's a question of your inheritance. It's a question of what are you going to receive? What kind of heavenly rewards are you going to get, you know? You either get your stuff here or you get your stuff there. <laughs> you hoard it down here 
or you lay it in store up there. Quite a difference between the two. One passes away, the world and the lust thereof, and the other abides forever. A lot we could say about that. So I ended with an introduction to the fourth rebellion after the wilderness of sin at Rephidim. I introduced this point of rebellion just before we started that section on faith versus fear, uh, where we spent four weeks. But Rephidim was where Moses struck the rock that produced water. That's Exodus 17, 1 through 7 and 19, 2. Also at Rephidim, Israel fought the Amalekites, where er while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer, and Joshua won a great victory over Amalek. And that's what we'll be looking today. That's in Exodus chapter 17. So at uh, rebellion test number four, what we've learned so far was it's a replay of test number two, which was the question of walking by faith and trusting God for water. We saw that there were four things in the replay. Israel questioned the motives of Moses. Israel accused Moses of murderous intent. And then parallel to that, Israel questioned the motives of God, and Israel thus accused God of murderous intent. And that's in Exodus 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched to Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Same test we saw before, but the test before was bad water. The test now is no water. So God is asking them the question, have you learned your lesson to trust me for water? Now, that's a basic necessity. You know, they're not trusting him here for... Um, solar-powered chariots to get them all the way to Egypt. They're trusting for basics. God wants us to trust him for basics. We, we, we assume basics are, are a given, that we're going to get it anyway. God wants us to trust him for basics, not just for the extra stuff. And then when we don't get the extra stuff, say, well, I guess that wasn't God's will. But surely God is going to give me the basics, food and water. Manna and water quail and water, manna, quail and water, and then everything else is gravy on top of that, right? Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. That worked before, remember? They griped at Moses and they got what they wanted. Griped at the messenger, messenger boy and then maybe the guy who sent the messenger will do something for you. But Moses said, why chide you with me? Wherefore, tempt ye the Lord. Verse 7, he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Come on, prove, prove God that you're here. You know, um, back when I was in high school, we had a, an interesting Bible class and um, the teacher was trying to teach us to defend our faith. And so uh, he said, um, okay, uh, I'm going to have one half of the class argue for the fact that there is no God. I'm going to have the other half of the class argue there is a God. And so we divided half and half against the room. And so a leader on the other side, he was a big, tall, black fellow, whom I think later became a Christian, but um, he died just recently, one of my classmates. And, uh, uh, but he went up to the board, and uh, he drew a great big X on the blackboard. And then he said, okay, God, if you're there, erase the X. Now, I think some of you probably have heard this. I've given this illustration before. And he walked back and forth across the front. He said, see, there is no God. If there was a God, he could erase the X. If there was a God, he could erase the X. Come on, God, where are you? Come and erase the X on the blackboard. And a young man over on my side, on the other side, got up, walked calmly to the front, erased the X, turned and said, God uses people, and sat down. <laughs> That's right on. <laughs> you know, when they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? If you're really there, you're going to do something about this problem. People, God uses people. He may use you in some case. I hope that you're willing to be used. So that brings us to today, our summary of the introduction to Rephidim, the keys that we've already learned in the test of Rephidim. First, Rephidim occurred just before they reached Mount Sinai, just before they received the law. But it's still counted as one of the ten times of rebellion 
based on the light that they already had about who God was and what his character was like. They had learned this in Egypt through the ten plagues. They had seen it as God stood between their camp and the camp of the Egyptians. They had seen it as Moses held out his rod across the sea and God parted the sea and they walked through, not on muddy land, on dry land. And God kept the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory presence between them and the Egyptians who stupidly followed them into the middle of the sea. And then it says God looked out of the cloud and he troubled the Egyptians. You know, he could have just let the water fall down behind them and then there's an open path all the way to the other shore. It says he troubled the Egyptians. What did he do? He gave them flat tires. <laughs> he took off all their wheels. It is great. I, I agree with you. <laughs> Wonderful. And it says and the Egyptians panicked. I mean, they said, the Lord fights for Israel. We've got to get out of here. And here we have a drag race. You know, the, the horses are dragging chariots. <laughs> they got a drag race going back toward Egypt. And then the waters enveloped them. And Israel made it safely to the other side. And the next morning they saw the dead bodies of the Egyptians. Should Israel have learned to walk by faith through these experiences? Yes. And here we have Israel questioning, is the Lord among us or not? Could they still see the pillar of cloud? Yes. Could they still see? When they're asking that question, could they still see the, the fire by night and the cloud by day? Yes. But they challenged God. Dear people, too many times in our lives we end up challenging God. Their judgment was not merely based on the law because that had not yet been given, but it was based on the light that they had concerning the true nature of God. That's why all men all over the world Every culture, every continent, every island, every subdivision of people, no matter where they are, no matter what kind of stuff they've been involved in, they have light from God for which they are held accountable. And that's precisely what Paul declares in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3. Romans chapter 1 deals with the light of nature. And Paul concludes at the end of Romans 1, they are all guilty. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, and what does he say? So that they are without excuse. And that's merely the basis of the light of creation. Even if they had nothing else, they are without excuse. What does that tell you about the PhD evolutionary scientists who believe that there is no God and that we all came here out of a big bang in the past. Nobody ever tells us where the cosmic egg came from that exploded, but a big bang in the past that created everything that was. So everything created itself. And they deny the existence of a sovereign, omnipotent God. And yet they study his handiwork every day. They look into the heavens. They see the immense universe spread out. They see the perfect order of the planets and the stars. They see the perfect order of our solar system. They look at the microcosm through the microscope and electronic microscopes, electron microscopes, where they can go down to the cellular and even lower than the cellular level of things. And they see perfect order. And they see the way that things function. And they say, it was an accident. There is no God. So that they are without excuse. You don't have to be some kind of a, a pagan in the middle of the jungle somewhere wearing a bone in your nose and worshiping some kind of a mango plant to, to come under that condemnation. There are people who claim to be intelligent and who do everything they can to shut Christians out of the public sphere, the public arena. They don't want to hear their message. They don't want them to give the message to anybody else. I read recently, within the last week I think it was, time goes so fast, about a, uh, a pro-life group, a Christian pro-life group on campus. It's an intervarsity group at a large major university. Uh, and um, they chose to have a leader, and they wouldn't have as members those who are not part of the um, 
Christian community. They, they wanted a Christian for the leadership, and they only let people become members who were Christians. And the university tried to shut them down and said, you can't be on our university campus. You can't be recognized in this official club. Now, that university Christian fellowship has been there for something like 40 years. But because they insisted you have to be a Christian and you have to have Christian moral standards, the university was trying to close them down. I was thinking about two different instances. The other instance was a pro-life group that was writing some, there was a space on the university where all groups were allowed to write their messages uh, on that area. It wasn't just a free speech area. And it was on the big, huge sidewalk out in front of some place. So they got permission like they were supposed to do. They wrote their messages on the sidewalk. One of the professors uh, in the university said, I don't like that message. So he gave a special assignment to his class and said, you'll get special credit for this. You go out there and erase the marks that those pro-life people have written on the sidewalk. You go and erase them. The person who had gone and gotten the permission for them to do their activity on the sidewalk, writing in chalk on the sidewalk, said, what are you doing? He says, I'm erasing uh, the messages. She said, well, this is our free speech. He said, the free speech area is over on the other side of campus. She said, but this is, is a public forum. This is a, an area where we're allowed to do this, and I got permission. He said, well, I'm exercising my free speech by erasing your free speech. So she made a complaint to a Christian legal organization. They sued the university, the university, and they sued the professor, and the professor is gonna have to pay damages. He lost. Good. But folks, they don't want to hear your message. This is the kind of stuff going on all the time. I can hardly keep it straight, <laughs> trying to focus on what I'm doing here, and I see all this legal stuff this, that we are at war. We are at war. And we're gonna talk about that with Amalek today because we are at war. It's a spiritual war. It's something that's on the attack against you like Amalek was on attack against Israel. So the light of creation, the light of conscience, is the second way. All men have a conscience. God has given it to them to know the difference between right and wrong. Now, they sear their consciences, and the New Testament talks about that. We're not going to get into detail, but Romans chapter 2 deals with the conscience. V verse 15, which show the work of the law in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. But you know, there's coming a day when they're going to be judged on the basis of that, because it says next verse, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Men are going to be judged and found guilty on the basis of what they saw in creation. Men are going to be judged on the basis of what they knew to be right and wrong, and they violated their conscience. You see, that's why Israel can be judged even though they haven't yet received the law. Number three is, of course, the light of special revelation, and that's Romans chapter 3. And you see that because the Jews are clearly, having been given the law, guilty. Then it says in Romans 3, 1, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So everybody is guilty. Whether you had the law or didn't have the law. Whether it was before the law or after the law. All are guilty before God. And that's what it says in verses 9 and following, Romans 3. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. One. In other words, no exceptions. There's not one good guy out there. Not one person can claim he or she is good. No, not one. And then Paul goes on down in verse 19 and following to say that every mouth is going to be stopped and all the world is going to become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there should be no flesh justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so uh, he comes to the conclusion as you get to the end of Romans chapter 3, that's why faith is necessary. We conclude then that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. He made them. It's us. <laughs> Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law because the law by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
Very important things to learn because that's what we have going on here in our text today. God is sending judgment even before they get to Mount Sinai. Now, just because the law doesn't save you does not mean that the law is bad. Neither creation or conscience is bad just because they don't save you. But in the same way, the law is not bad just because it doesn't save you. However, it does mean that the law produces the greatest level of accountability for man for declaring the nature and the character of God and what he requires of man. That's the point of verse 31. There's a second lesson of application at Rephidim. Second lesson of application. Since Christ is the one who is both savior and judge, the events at Rephidim give us further insight into his character. And Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 13. Now, Christ delivered Israel from Egypt. He was their savior. He's also their judge. We're supposed to learn something from that. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, that's the Shekinah that led them through the wilderness, and all passed through the sea. So he's taking us back to the point of the Exodus where Israel left Egypt. Next verse is very interesting to me, especially for our dear Baptist friends. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now a question for you. On that occasion, who got wet? <laughs> it wasn't the children of Israel, but it says they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That is, they were identified with. That's what baptizo means in its root. It means to identify or to identify with. A permanent form of identification. It's not a matter of how much water you use to get yourself wet. It was Pharaoh's army that got immersed, and they definitely weren't saved. We find Israel goes through on dry ground, and Israel is dry when they come out on the other side. It didn't just sort of slosh around their feet. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink the same spiritual drink? Now, you know, we've just been talking about the meat and the water, right? There was manna, there was quail, there was water. Bad water, no water. But it talks about them eating spiritual meat, drinking spiritual drink. They were getting something that was out of the ordinary, even though it was ordinary, in the way in which they took it. What was it? It tells you at the end of verse 4, they all did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It's one of the theophanies of the Old Testament. We find that going through, they needed water. God said to Moses, strike the rock. And he struck the rock, and water poured out. And there was enough to feed millions of people, or give a drink to millions of people. Plenty of water from tapping a rock. It was a very special rock. Paul tells us why it's a very special rock. He says that rock was Christ. He was providing for them where there was no provision. And he met their needs. The second time they had no water, we'll get to those tests a little bit later on, God told Moses, speak to the rock and the water will come. Moses was really bent out of shape by this time. He'd been going 40 years with these people and listened to them bellyache and gripe and bellyache and gripe and complain and murmur and moan and groan and cuss at him. You know, he'd put up with it for a long time. And Moses said, what, ye rebels? Must we bring you, we, oh, Moses, you're losing it. Must we bring you water out of this rock? And he smacked the rock. But God had told him, speak to the rock. God was merciful. God brought water out of the rock, and God brought the water to the people. But because of that, God said to Moses, you're going to see the land, 
but you're not going to go in. What? After 40 years of putting up with that group? 40 years of miserable wandering through the wilderness? 40 years of always listening to bickering and backbiting and infighting? God said, yeah, you'll see it. But you won't go in. That's a serious lesson for us. Let me go on. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now get verse 6. Memorize the first six words. Now these things were our examples. Do you understand why I'm spending some time on the wilderness wanderings and the sins of Israel and reasons God killed them? Now, these things are our examples. Let's say it together. Now, these things are our examples. Mm. I hope we learn them. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. These things were examples for what purpose? To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day 23,000. Neither let us tempt Christ. Well, you say, oh, that doesn't apply to them. <laughs> they didn't tempt Christ. Oh, well, yes, they did. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. See, he just told us the rock that followed him was Christ. We already know from our studies in the past that Christ was the one who was walking before them in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who spoke to Moses out of the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. The Lord Jesus Christ before the incarnation, the pre-incarnate Christ is the one who led Israel out of the wilderness, is the one who gave them all the different laws that related to the sacrifices because all the sacrifices foreshadowed him. All the lambs, all the blood, all the articles of the tabernacle, all the furnishings of the tabernacle. And he was in the midst of his people. Dear people, these are examples for us. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. These are ones we haven't studied yet, the different things that happened in the wilderness. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, listen to it again in verse 11, if you missed the point in verse 6. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples and are written for our admonition. Do you know why the book of Exodus was written, it tells you right there. It was written not for them. It was written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So if you don't pay attention to the basics, one plus one equals two, you're going to fail it when somebody asks you, please give me the square root of pi. You've got to learn the basics. If you don't know how to spell cat, you're not going to know the difference between cat and cut and caught when you see it on a page. You've got to learn the basics. Exodus is the basics. It's an admonition for believers today to learn how God acts and what is his character like. How does he deal with his own people? Not merely how he deals with the pagans. We're all excited when he deals with the pagans and smacks them hard. But how's he going to deal with you? How's he going to deal with me? You say, well, I think I'm okay. Uh, you know, I haven't done any of those bad things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not really, really that bad. Oh, no, look at verse 12. Wherefore, but him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. You think you're okay? You know what? Pride goeth before destruction 
and an haughty spirit before a fall. You think you're okay? You're about to trip and fall on your face. Are you not paying attention to the admonitions, to the warning signs, be signs beside the road? You're going to go off the cliff. But we have hope. Verse 13 is our hope verse. It's one that I told you I memorized as one of my life verses a long time ago. There hath no temptation taken you. Now you're going to see every kind of temptation hit Israel in the wilderness. Every kind of temptation hits Israel in the wilderness. They're tempted to all seven deadly sins and lots of other sins as well. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Nothing you ever face is going to be unique. Nothing you ever face is going to be one of those rare, rare instances that nobody has ever written about and you never saw a Bible verse on it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common. Common means it happens all the time to everybody. Common to man. But, and I love these, whatever the word but shows up in Scripture. But, oh, next three words. God is faithful. If you belong to him, remember, God is faithful. And it tells you how he's faithful when you face a common temptation. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able you can't say, well, I know it's a common temptation, but I was too weak for it when it hit me. You know, I, I just had to do it. I just had to do it. I was dealing with somebody this week that went on and on about how I just had to do it, just had to do it. I said, no, no, you didn't have to do it. Oh, I had to do it. I had to do it. I said, no, you didn't have to do it. And this person was also saying, oh, man, you know, uh, I, I have such and such that I want to, I'm thinking about in my mind, and I, I just have to do it. I said, no, you don't have to do it. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you, that is, he will not allow you, to be tempted above that ye are able. Now, everybody has a different level of ability. Everybody has a different level of spiritual strength. But God knows what it is, and God makes sure that the temptations that hit you, although they may be in the same kind of categories, never go above the level of your spiritual strength. God is able, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation. Here's another one of those buts. But will, not maybe, we sure hope, well, it's possible, but will with the temptation. So a temptation comes along, there's something nailed to its side. But will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, folks, that's in the context of knowing what the ten sins of Israel were in the wilderness. That's in the context of knowing how the people of God tempted God. That's in the context of the seven deadly sins. That's in the context of people yielding to the flesh. That's in the context of carnal people murmuring and griping and complaining and rebelling. God makes a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You feel that pressure inside. You feel you want to explode. You feel you want to do this. You feel you want to do that. God is faithful. Remember that. If you don't take the way of escape, you know what you're saying? You're saying, number one, God is not faithful. Number two, he didn't keep his promise. There was no way of escape. Number three, I saw the way of escape, but there was no way I could get to it. Listen, you, if you're a believer, have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God who will empower you to take the way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Twice in this passage, they were examples for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. They were examples and they're written for our admonition. That's why you need to know Exodus. That's why you need to know what Israel faced. Now, let me give you some practical application to the issue of being frustrated. Now, I know you all, and some of you are perpetually frustrated. <laughs> Should I ask for a show of hands? How many of you are perpetually frustrated? Nobody's going to raise their hand, I know, because <laughs> you know I'm about to preach against it, right? <laughs> 
Perpetual frustration. Some of us have that. We're always frustrated about something. You know, it was on that very issue that Moses lost his privilege of going into the promised land. I mentioned a moment ago, he not only lost the privilege of going into the promised land, he lost the principal and major reward after 40 years of obedience. He lost it after 40 years of obedience, after 40 years of walking by faith. After 40 years of talking face to face with God, he lost it. How long have you been a Christian? You've been a Christian 40 years? Some of you have been Christians longer than that. What are you losing? What are you losing? You know, the critical lesson we learned from this is that being frustrated is not an excuse for failure to obey precisely. Let me say that again. Being frustrated is not an excuse for failure to obey precisely. I'm just going to read it to you. Numbers chapter 20. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode at Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation. <laughs> Have we seen this test twice before? Mm -hmm. We saw bad water. We saw no water. Now we're at the end of 40 years. God took care of them for 40 years. And they gathered themselves together. <laughs> Here we go back to test number one. Rebellion against ordained leadership is rebellion against God. They gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron. And the people chode with Moses. Have we heard these words before? And spake saying, Would God we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. In other words, well, we're not going to think all the way back maybe to Egypt. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, we had a bunch of other guys die in the wilderness. And man, they're at peace now. Oh, man, I wish we died when they died. Did they really want that? And why have ye brought the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die? Do we hear the same kind of stupid accusations that we heard 40 years before this? People don't change, do they? It's the same stupidity, the same bad-mouthing, the same false accusations... The same carnal, selfish, self-centeredness. Listen, folks. Only the grace of God can change you from being like that. And some of you have not absorbed the grace of God. You continue to walk with these kinds of attitudes. I'll quit meddling, go on and preaching. And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt? to bring us into this evil place. It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there water to drink. In other words, they're thinking about their bellies. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod. He's carried that same stick for 40 years. Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. Now listen, here is the key. And speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. They were worried about their animals, just like Peta is worried about the animals today. And he goes and euthanizes them. Anyway, and Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. 
And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, now Aaron is in on this. It's not just Moses. Aaron's in on it. Gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? This is the rock that followed them all the way through the wilderness wanderings. Do you think the people didn't wander about a rock that was always there? No matter where they went, the rock was there. Moses said, uh, Paul says the rock that followed them was Christ. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. Bang, bang! And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron. Aaron should have hold his hand and said, man, don't hit it. Just talk to it. See what happens. Aaron didn't do it. Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. In other words, Moses, I just tested your faith. You didn't believe me. You're used to banging stuff with that rock. Checking under, you know, stones to see if there's scorpions and snakes and, you know, leaning on it when you're tired. You think it's the rod that does the magic trick. You didn't believe me. What did I tell you to do? Tell me precisely what I told you to do. Oh, something about the rock. Uh, I did, let's see, the, what did you say about the rock? Oh, you said speak to the rock. Oh, people think I'm nuts. I'm talking to rocks. Hey, folks, sometimes we don't obey because we worry about what other people are going to think about us. Sometimes we don't obey because we think, oh, well, it worked a different way last time. Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. In other words, it wasn't only you, Moses, that this affected. If you had believed me, it would have done something with the children of Israel. You would have sanctified me in their eyes. Because you failed to believe, I, the living God, the one who has provided for all of this children of Israel through the entire wilderness wanderings, I was not sanctified because of what you did instead of obeying what I said. How many times have we failed to do what God clearly has told us to do in his word, and because of that, he was not sanctified in the eyes of someone else? Because we did it our own way. We did it the practical way. We did it the pragmatic way. We did it the way that we thought was best. We didn't do what God told us to do in his word. Folks, that is the final touchstone. If it is in conflict, even in the smallest iota, it's disobedience. That act of Moses probably took less than five seconds. And he lost 40 years of rewards. Let that sink in. Because you believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, here's the results. Ye shall not bring. Ye, that's plural. Moses, I'm talking to you and Aaron. Aaron, you were in on this. You were there at the door of the tabernacle, standing with Moses when I told you guys what to do. And I told Moses to be the spokesman. I told him to talk. I didn't tell him to hit. You didn't stop him. Therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah. Because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. God was sanctified by what he did to Moses and Aaron. Do you get it? God will be sanctified. They failed to sanctify him in the eyes of the people. God said, I'm going to be sanctified. I'm going to kill you guys before you go into the land. 
We learn a great deal about prayer at Rephidim as well. This event here at Rephidim gives a physical illustration of the exhortation by the Apostle Paul regarding the spiritual warfare that the Christian faces in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Ah, oh, man, I have a lot on this, and there's no way I'm going to get through it in the next three minutes. But next week, the Lord willing, we're going to look at Exodus 17 and then compare it with Ephesians chapter 6. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for being the God who is there, the God who is sovereign, the God who always provides for you those who are your children, and the God who expects precise obedience, not half-hearted obedience, not 99% obedience, 100% obedience. And how much more you hold leaders accountable who fail in their responsibilities to sanctify you in the eyes of the congregation. Father, we pray that you'll take the word of God and apply it to each of our hearts as you best see fit. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.